And good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to another session of McLean's Live. My name is Paul Wells. I am a senior writer at McLean's Magazine. I'm speaking to you from my home in Ottawa, because that's where everyone does everything these days. Um, uh, we want to right off the bat thank our sponsors at the Canadian Bankers Association for bringing all of these weekly conversations to you. Uh, and um, since the beginning of this uh, web-based series uh, a couple months ago now, I have not been very apologetic about bringing artists as well as politicians and other newsmakers uh, to talk about the work that they do, because one of the things that fascinates me about uh, this pandemic and the resulting lockdown is how it keeps artists from doing their art. It keeps uh, audiences from seeing the art. It keeps communities from being communities. And I think that's, uh, frankly, an underappreciated element of this whole thing. Uh, and um, there's been an awful lot going on in the headlines uh, that we also need to discuss. And um, we're lucky to have uh, someone here who can um, address all of these from a kind of unique perspective. Um, I've been fortunate for the last couple of years to get to know Kevin Loring, who is the uh, inaugural artistic director of Indigenous Theatre at the National Arts Centre. He leads the first attempt by a national institution to bring Indigenous voices and Indigenous art to a national audience. And uh, he was already having a hell of a season when things got weird in March. And, uh, and he's here to talk about all of that with us uh, today. Hey, Kevin, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, as I said, it was uh, middle of March when the lockdown happened. The National Arts Center, um, which is based here in Ottawa, as, as are you, you're speaking to us from Ottawa. Um, uh, based in Ottawa, has a national mandate, a national audience, um, was a week away from announcing all the good things that the National Arts Center Orchestra and English theater, French theater, dance, indigenous theater, uh, all the things that uh, everyone was going to do next season. And then uh, you got the word that you had to go to ground and spend months trying to figure out what was going to happen next. Um, how did that, um, what was that like? I guess is the first question to ask. <laughs> uh, well, it was, it was, uh, it was incredibly challenging. Um, it's heartbreaking, uh, let alone, you know, that we had to cancel our, our season uh, early. I mean, we found that as it, as it rolled out, you know, oh, you know, as it became more and more apparent, we had to cancel a season, that was devastating. And then all of the work going into a season uh, was suddenly wiped clean. Um, and so we had to start from scratch. Well, not necessarily start from scratch. We hope that uh, a number of the works that we had planned for the coming season once we get back up and into the building again, that we would be have an opportunity to bring them back in. So we're, we're not trying to throw that work away. So a lot of that contracting work and all the behind the scenes work that goes into bringing uh, a piece of theater into the art center, um, we've already done a lot of that legwork. So hopefully we can, when we get back into the building, uh, a number of, like those, those shows will be able to be um, you know, presenced on our stage. So that's, that's the hope. But, Absolutely, that was, you know, it was it's a lot of work that goes into marketing a season, getting ready for uh, the coming year, uh, and all of that was immediately like a whiteboard, just, just like wiped clean. Um, maybe you can tell us in your own words, what's the mandate of Indigenous theatre? And what, uh, once you have this sort of general mandate, once you yourself uh, were appointed as artistic director, what were you trying to do and say with the, the first season? Well, uh, very important thing, and, and, and I should have said this right off the top, I'm very honored to be living here on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation, the Algonquin people. Um, and so a lot of our work in, in, uh, in our first year, and you know, even before we had plays on stages, was reaching out to the Algonquin Nation uh, and, the, and to the, the communities and to uh, just acknowledge that we are here and that this department is happening here on, on their territory and their land. And so, and to find ways of being able to reflect um, that fact in the space. And so to welcome the Algonquin Nation into the NAC in a, in a way that makes them feel like that's their home as well. Uh, and so a lot of that work, a lot of outreach, a lot of community outreach um, to the leadership and to the community members of uh, the Algonquin Nation um, was, you know, right off the top, a big part of it because we really need to be rooted in that. Uh, as, as an Indigenous department at the National Arts Centre, we need to be rooted um, in where we are 
Um, but also uh, a big part of what we tried to try to embody was this idea of that we are um, presencing indigenous work on our stages from all regions of this land. So to be able to have representation from the, the, the real north, far north, um, from the Inuit, uh, from you know all the way across to the Pacific and all the way over to the to the Atlantic Oceans and everything in between, uh, and to try to presence as much of that, you know, it's an impossible task because it's a vast, vast nation, many different peoples, and so uh, a vast country, a vast landmass, many nations, and but to have as much representation as we could muster within a season uh, was a big priority and remains a, a, a ongoing priority for the department. So that was a huge part of it. But also like in our first season, as you well know, it was about honoring uh, indigenous women. Uh, and so a lot of the most, the majority, the vast majority of the work were, were led by indigenous women or created by indigenous women. And so that was uh, a big priority for us this year. And one of the things that was really striking for me as a sort of an NAC regular was that um, indigenous theater really sort of took over the building uh, uh, for the month of September. There were concerts, uh, small scale, medium scale, large scale things. There were there was an open lobby with um, uh, uh, craftsmen spending the, the the month building a bridge park canoe in the lobby. Um, and 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 I, I guess the point of that was to say you weren't kind of tiptoeing your way into a corner of this august institution. You were uh, planting a flag, making a statement. Yeah, I mean, I, and initially we were calling it the takeover, right? Um, that we were the indigenous takeover, for, for, you know, that was sort of the nickname for it. Uh, Mushkomo is, is what the, our festival was called, Mushkomo, uh, which is an Algonquin word that means uh, something that is emerging out of water to be seen, uh, something that is revealing itself. And that was sort of uh, very poetic, um, I think, the Algonquin nation for the gift of that word. Um, but yeah, we had, you know, we sold over 15,000 tickets in the month of, month of uh, September for Mushkumo. We had, you know, uh, so many folks come into the building who would say, you know, I've lived in Ottawa my whole life. I've never been inside the NAC. Uh, it was, it was uh, pretty spectacular. Uh, I have to throw my hands up for uh, uh, Lori Marchand who came up with the idea of doing the, uh, the, the, she's, she leads the department with me. She's the managing director of Indigenous Theatre. And uh, it was her idea to do the uh, canoe journey down the canal, which opened the, the opening ceremonies, which is really beautiful and, and a really symbolic way of marking uh, our entrance into this new era at, the, at this institution. Uh, a real Indigenous-led, Indigenous-centric uh, um, event. You know, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was intense. It almost killed us. Uh, Doing a festival of that intensity right out of the gate with our little team, uh, we're really just a startup. You know, it was it was a, a bit more uh, to chew than we realized, uh, I think. But uh, it was exciting. It was a exhausting, exciting, beautiful time. Yeah. When you are uh, planning all of these events, who's your main audience? Is it uh, is it largely for an indigenous audience? Is it largely for folks like me to whom almost all of this work is new? Uh, who are you sort of pointing it at? Well, we, we are very conscious that, uh, that the mass, vast majority of the folks who come to the NAC are not uh, Indigenous. And so, but we do uh, aim this work at Indigenous audiences. We do want to, we, uh, we have a $15 community ticket um, for anybody who identifies as an Indigenous uh, person. Uh, they don't have to show an ID or anything. They just say, I'm Indigenous, and they get a $15 ticket. And it's actually was a very successful program for the first year that we've had it. Uh, but that is a way to bring and to invite uh, community members, Indigenous community members, into the building to come see our work. But for sure, we are very aware that the vast majority of our audience is non-Indigenous. Uh, but we do, you know, we are presencing Indigenous work uh, and we are very much want to be engaged with the, the indigenous community in, in, in Ottawa and, and the country, really. Uh, so that's, that's really what we're, we're looking at. But we know that there is interest in the work that we're doing from the non-indigenous community, absolutely. I've never had a problem uh, in any of the work over the years that I've been involved with, 
with an o- with audience being interested in the work that we're presenting, whether it's you know pr- you know produced by an indigenous uh, company or not. I think that the work. Um, I mean, that's always ideal, but uh, that's not always the case across the country. We're always at a deficit of human infrastructure, really. Like, we don't have the, enough personnel, uh, indigenous personnel in, in the different fields uh, that support theater or producing companies. But uh, whenever we've, whenever I've been a part of a project, the audience has come. Uh, and it's not because of just me. It's just like it's they're interested in the indigenous work. They're interested in that story. And I think that we've... Our numbers have been fantastic for our first season. Um, we have, uh, you know, we have many sold out shows, uh, uh, lots of really positive feedback. So, you know, we were in the midst of a very strong inaugural season before this all uh, knocked us back into our homes. <laughs> uh, and I have to assume there's touring plans um, uh, as, as, as soon as next season or? Uh, well, we'll see. I mean, I, I, it depends on how, I mean, we, we, I started off with all kinds of massive aspirations, right? Really <laughs> ambitious ideas uh, that, uh, you know, the reality sort of kicks in on what you can actually accomplish and the limitations of the role, uh, which has been a huge learning curve for me. You go in there going, I want to do this, and I want to do that, I want to go here, and, and all these things. But then you realize, well, that's actually not possible at this time uh, for all kinds of reasons. Um, and so... Yes, I mean, we, I, I really believe truly that the NAC with its national mandate needs to be uh, in other parts of the country. And however that happens through partnerships, through touring, through supporting work, um, it's, a, it's a vital part of the, the mandate and from my perspective, especially for Indigenous theatre. One of the things that constrained your ability to get stuff done early on was that despite literally years of uh, effort by the National Arts Center to get the federal government to directly finance Indigenous theater. Uh, that funding request was turned down only a few months before you were going to launch your season. That must have thrown a hell of a wrench into, into what you were trying to do. Yeah, I was disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have many colleagues who are hoping you don't say a lot more than that. but. Uh, <laughs> Um, I assume it's back to the drawing board and there's going to be an attempt to um, uh, persuade the federal government to be more forthcoming with funding uh, in future seasons. Yes, and I'm less involved in any of that than I was previously, that's for sure. But, uh, and so, and that, I think that's a good thing uh, to a degree. And yeah, so I, I, I you know, the, the NAC is is doing its part to, to make sure that the, the department is supported and funded and, you know, going forward we will be, but, uh, you know, there, there are costs to including a, a new, brand new department into a, an institution like the NAC, that uh, you've got to find the money somewhere. And so we've been very fortunate with a, a lot of private and corporate donations uh, that, have, that have supported the department directly, and, and we're incredibly grateful for that. Uh, and, you know, I thank those people and those organizations for, for seeing the importance of the department. And, uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes going forward. Because it, it seems to me, if I can be so bold, that um, the arrival of something like Indigenous Theatre at a place like the National Arts Centre, sure, it's a test for you and your colleagues on your ability to um, produce work that reaches broad audience, but it's also a test for the National Arts Centre. It's a test for the audience. It's a test for Canada to some extent. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, like uh, the NAC has, has done a pretty awesome job of getting us in there and doing uh you know the best they can to to make sure that that you know there was a lot of work that went into you know before i even uh they even started looking for an artistic director um but there's always places for improvement and and any kind of new thing like this and uh especially you know with such a different you know with artists inviting indigenous folks into such a colonial institution there are challenges with that there are natural challenges with that right like it is there are, there are things that we just do not, our worldviews just do not uh, see eye to eye sometimes. And, and you have to find a way around that. But the NAC has been very uh, self, you know, self-aware of that and doing its best. And you know, there's always you know, hiccups here and there. Um, but uh, the intent is there that this is, a, this is permanent. This has is, this is already transformed the internal workings of how the NAC operates and, and will continue to. Uh, 
help it evolve. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, it couldn't come at a better time in some ways, right? Like we, at, at where we are right now in the conversation around the world, right? And in, in, in the conversation about um, race relations, about uh, historical inequities and things like that, having the indigenous department already being there within the institution has already helped to open a lot of perceptions. And it's not always perfect. And there are always things where uh, things get uh, become conflicted. But uh, uh, there are all kinds of mechanisms to get through that uh, and, and finding, finding new paths forward. And, and Lori and I have been doing our, our, you know, our best to, to help guide the NAC uh, towards, uh, you know, a right direction. Now, um, the second season that you were going to announce in March, um, uh, do you have any sense, even now, it's almost July, do you have any sense how much of that season survives and can be uh, presented next season? Uh, and, and what were you trying to accomplish with, with a second season for Indigenous? Yeah, that's, those are really great questions. Um, we're, you know, we... <laughs> We're trying to even save some of the coming season and trying to find ways of doing it in spite of uh, the COVID um, restrictions. Um, and as we get closer to, you know, the reality of some of those things, those, those begin to also fall off the table. So it's really, it's incredibly difficult and incredibly challenging to try to navigate where we're going to be in a year or two. You know, I, I personally am like, well, I don't even know how we're having these conversations that we actually have a vaccine about how we're bringing work and, and audiences into the building, uh, let alone, you know, rehearsing a cast. Like, do we ha are we going to have to, you know, until there's a vaccine, you're going to have to quarantine for two weeks after you fly some, from somewhere else in the country and all of those massive, massive, and every one of those things has, an, a, has a cost, has a financial cost to it at a time when we don't have uh, any revenue coming into the building because we can't sell tickets. And, you know, so it becomes a, this enormous sort of like, ah, every time you pull a string, you know, it just, uh, it just unravels more and more. And so it's incredibly challenging. We had, there's at least half the shows, uh, if not all of them, we want to find a way to bring back in the, in the, once we get into the, into a bums and seats kind of situation where we can open the, the building to the public. Uh, but it, you know, I can say that now and it might change in two years. We don't know where those, those artists will be uh, in terms of where they're interested in presenting at that time and how much the world has changed. That maybe the, the, the works themselves are not, uh, you know, don't fit where we're at, you know. And so, yeah, maybe half of them would get into the first season back into, this, into the building, but uh, even that is, it's hard to say. We would do our best though to try to, to maintain our commitment to those artists. You know, we've, you know, those, those works are excellent. They deserve to be on the, on those stages. Um, and we would do everything we could to, to make sure that they get in there regardless. Have you given any thought to performing them in empty venues for video? Yeah. And, and in fact, that's, that's, we were, there was one that we were hoping to do as an outdoor concert uh, in September. Uh, but as we went through the, again, we go through all of these, these mental exercises of planning out what it would take, to get something like that to occur. And by the time you get to the end of it, it's like it's so astronomically expensive or it's just logistically impossible uh, to maintain crowds and distance and things like that, that it just starts to fall away. But yeah, there are, there are continuing conversations about, uh, there are you know, a few solo shows in the, in the season that we would be presenting. Um, and, or even, you know, like Michelle's show that we just lost this season, Michelle Thrush, uh, Inner Elder is a solo show. Um, we could do that in the studio uh, for broadcast potentially, um, if that's you know. But even but it's meant to be live, right? So like there's there is a there is an enormous sort of like cost just artistically to doing it over Zoom, right? Like even in this conversation, it's not ideal, uh, but it, it works. It's fine. You get you get a sense of it. But the point is that it's theater. It's live. It's meant to be in community, in, in a space surrounded by other human beings, you know, uh, and to have, you know, the, you know this disease uh, take that very fundamental human need away is tragic. <laughs> you know, it's really, really hard. And the artists feel it. The art, you know, playing for an empty house is, uh, is fine in tech week, but when you, when you get up on the boards and you want that response from the audience, that's what feeds you as an artist. 
is that response. And, and when all you get are like little thumbs up sort of going up in your screen, you can't really engage with that. You can't feel that. And, and, and the work suffers because of that, I think. Um, yeah. I mean, I've got a lot of friends who are uh, artists and especially a lot of musicians. And um, uh, the, the, the sense of something important having been lost is palpable in almost everything they say all the time. I mean, it's the interaction with the audience is a huge part of it. The interaction among audience members, the, the, the sort of group realization that something has happened or that uh, you've reached a turning point in the story. And uh, that's something that, to say the least, is quite hard to simulate. That's, you really have to be there. Yeah, I mean, you go to the theater, I believe, to, to connect with community, to have a moment of catharsis in a group setting, right? Like to, to, to engage um, empath, you know, empathically or empathetically with the, with the story that's going on, with the narrative that's being presented, with the character's journey. And as a, as a community sitting together, breathing together, which is now dangerous, uh, you, you, you have an experience that you share with 500 other people in the room. Uh, and that is the, that is the transformative um, juice of live performance, right? Like when you're, all, when you're watching a wicked band go and everybody's heads are bobbing and moving around, like you feel the room, right? And as an artist on stage, you feel the room and that, that, that energy exchange of attention and interest and uh, that's, that's the magic of live performance. And to, to not have that and to be doing everything through a screen uh, is an incredible loss. Um, and can't wait to get back into the room again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel that too myself and uh, uh, everyone's got their fingers crossed. Um, there's another thing that you said that I sure don't want to let slip. And as a matter of fact, I'd like to focus on it for the next little bit, which is this idea that since March, the conversation has changed and the whole context within which um, uh, Indigenous theatre is doing its work uh, has changed because of the politics, because as part of this sort of um, extraordinary um, um, consciousness lifting that, that, that has happened across North America, across the world since the murder of George, George Floyd, uh, and, and, and the realization that we have an awful lot of unfinished business here in Canada with Black and with Indigenous populations, um, that th I, th I get the impression that that also has caused you to question some of what you want to do and to, to you know, rethink some of what you want to do. I don't know if it's maybe, maybe made me rethink, but it is definitely, um, I mean, it's, it's funny because like, it's not something we haven't been saying for a long, long time. You know, like the, the inequities and the things that we've, we've been saying it, uh, as Indigenous or uh, IB POC artists in the, in the country, we've, we've been saying these things for a long time. And, and these recent incidents have really, you can't look away from it. You cannot deny what you've seen now, right? Uh, but, you know, we've called the Highway of Tears the Highway of Tears for like 47 years. Um, you know, we've just gone through all of these, these institutional exercises of uncovering that have not yet landed, I think, with the general public. But for Indigenous folks, we're like, yeah, we have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we've had the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry, and none of those have fully landed, uh, I think, in the, in the general population in, in the same way that, that we're experiencing now. But those, these this uprising is, I think, uh, and this awakening uh, in, in a number, number of ways, it's like, well, we've been saying this all along and it's, it's kind of frustrating too that uh, people are just now seeing it because they can't deny it because they watched it on CNN over and over again. They've seen, uh, they've seen it with their own eyes and what it looks and what that uh, looks like. And so uh, going forward, I think, what we are looking at when we're really talking about the institutions across the country, like what is not just the NAC, but what are our institutions and how are they made up and what are they functioning to do? What are they there for uh, as publicly funded institutions? Like I'm talking about arts institutions across the country. Uh, and that conversation is, is really being had now in a way that uh, was sort of, and, and people are calling out people just giving lip service to it as well, right? Like nobody's getting away from it at this point in time. And I think that it's a really important time. I think, that's, I think this, this is a really important time 
Uh, I mean, we're all shut down. We're all in this lockdown. Um, we're all sort of having this moment of being, having to sit here in our homes and really think about these things and really question the way in which uh, we've been, you know, rolling through society, doing what the society has been doing and, and our culture is, is, is doing. Um, and now I think is a time to hit the reset button to like, you know, when you, you know, your operating system isn't working properly and hasn't been working for a long time, you need to upgrade. And I think that in that upgrade, we need to really include uh, the indigenous voice in our institutions. We need to include the, uh, the BIPOC folks of our, of our communities into, the, into these institutions. You know, I sit in these Zoom meetings uh, day after day uh, with organizations across the country. And, you know, I, I can sit in the, the you know, for, for example, like the A House theaters of the country. You know, I think there was five of the 58 people in, I think there was five or seven of us who were uh, of any ethnicity, like other than white, right? And these are all the, this is the leadership, the artistic leadership from coast to coast to coast, right? Um, you know, there's stories emerging, you know, of, of you know, um, their communities rebelling against the artistic leadership of their eight house institutions in, in cities across the country right now. And it's because of that feeling of being systemically excluded. And we all have, as Indigenous and, and, and BIPOC artists, we, we all have those, those experiences of being shut out or feeling like we've been shut out. Um, and I think now is, now is the time to really uh, to change all that. Now, now more than ever, you know? Um, there's a, a kind of an unofficial slogan of, of Indigenous theater at the NAC, which is that you say, our stories are medicine. And um, so maybe part of the what's changing is the willingness of the audience to take some of that medicine and to um, be receptive to, to, to messages. You're right that that, that um, you and your predecessors have been sending for decades and longer. You, you know, I, like I was saying, I've never had a problem selling Indigenous uh, theater. And it, before I was at the NAC, even in my old or in my in the company that I run as well in British Columbia. And, and as my uh, my role as an actor, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, we've always had, you know, we do we put on a show. People come to it because they're interested in the stories, and it's something that they're not accustomed to to receiving uh, as that insight. Um, and I think what a lot of theaters run into is the, the challenge of outreach. They don't know how to go into communities that they're not a part of, and so that that's a critical skill. So the marketing department of any organization is geared to getting bums in seats and they know how to reach a, a, a sort of the this one type of audience often and they just sort of often in some institutions you can't even program works that you might want to as an artistic director because the marketing department has no idea how to market it and so they'll push back on you and say well i don't know what to do with that you know and so those those kinds of processes need to be re-examined and though the communities that uh that exist in every city across this country that don't traditionally come to the theater, they've never been invited. Mushkomo uh, in September was, uh, I think, was it in one of the conversations, it was, uh, I think it's either Kimberly Rampersat or Wayne from uh, Soul Pepper said, uh, I can't remember who said it, but I'm gonna give tribute to either one of those, but they said, I think it was Kimberly actually, uh, the radical act of invitation. Mushkomo was a radical act of invitation. We were like, we're, we are here, this is your space, this is, this is your home, this is your living room. You are more than welcome here. And we're gonna do everything in our power to extend that invitation to you on an ongoing basis. And Mushkino, Mushkimo was just the beginning of that. It's a radical act of invitation. And I think that uh, theaters across the country or institutions across the country would do very well to engage in those radical acts of invitation and to, to open their spaces to, to uh, audiences that don't traditionally come to their theater. Um, and I think that we would all be better for it. When you finally do start touring, um, it seems to me then that the choice of venues for the various uh, stops on a, on a tour would become very important because where you are in a community when you invite the community in starts to take on a real significance. Absolutely. Um, you know, that, and that, that hospitality, that sense of hospitality, we are, we are hosts, you know, at the NAC or any institution, we're hosting, we're a hosting space for community to come in and, and engage in this work. Um, and that's a, to take on that role instead of like 
uh, instead of maybe being, you know, just sort of directed to, to one in one direction uh, in our institution, um, to be a, a host to different communities. It's a real, I think, for a lot of institutions, they don't know how to engage in that way. You know what I mean? They don't know how to reach out to those different communities. Um, and they're afraid to. And, and part of that is because they, the, the body of the institution themselves is not made up with very many, with a very diverse, um, uh, you know, employees, right? Like the, the, the actual institution is, is mainly white. I mean, there's, there's a term, right? Mainly white institutions. Um, and that's who they cater to, right? <laughs> and it's no surprise. It's no surprise to anybody. Um, and, and so I think that it's, it's, it's time to change that, right? Like it, now is the time, let's, let's, let's flip that. Um, and one of the sort of um, defining characteristics of indigenous theater at the NAC is the extraordinary diversity um, uh, within the indigenous community in Canada, among, the, among nations, within communities, uh, your own play, Where the Blood Mixes, for which you won the Governor General's Literary Award a few years ago was performed um, on success on successive nights in English and in French. I, I believe for the first time. Yes. And and then uh, there were audiences were hearing Cree on stage. We we're hearing uh, Inuktitut. We were hearing all sorts of different languages, often in the same um, production. Um, how much of a challenge was that? And and what was it like hearing your play before? you know, two very different audiences on successive nights. It was really cool. Um, I brought my family to see it and sat with them. And we watched it in French and they got a kick out of it because, you know, every time the intercontinental words would come up, they'd go, oh, I know where I am now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it translated incredibly well. You know, there's a, a Francophone company um, based out of Montreal, Francophone artists, bilingual artists. And, uh, you know, that was, it was, it was really astonishing to see Lit in British Columbia, portrayed by a Montreal-based indigenous company in French, um, but it worked. And and the reason was that it, that the experiences were translatable. And and Charles Charles Bender, who who translated it and directed it, and then played Mooch in the production, did an excellent job of directing it as well. That was a beautiful production. Those artists are amazing. Like I can't, I couldn't imagine doing. Uh, a play like that in two different languages, you know, and, you know, Marco, the, the actor who played Floyd in that production, he's, he had this, the farthest to go in terms of his English. Uh, and it was amazing to see how his, him struggling with the language actually translated as uh, emotional frustration, or he was just in the moment. And, you know I mean? Like that struggle was really quite cool. But per, honestly, the, you know, there's a lot of, I think, again, there's a lot of fear around pres presencing indigenous languages on stage well will our audience understand uh for example the um the the circus piece that we put on uh this this winter um yep. uh you know it was entirely in English, almost entirely in English. there was some french and there's a little bit of english but it, the, the the majority of the narrative was in English. but you didn't need to understand you didn't need to understand it to know what was happening on stage it translated through action, it translated through the spectacle of it. Um, and I have, in my own work, I do quite a bit of work in Inklikamuxchin, in my community work. I, I put plays on that have Inklikamuxchin, which is the language that, that I come from, uh, alongside English. Uh, it, and it's woven into the pieces as well. And it's a way of using the language as a, as a or the play as a, a language reclamation tool, right? Like when those, as those plays are published or, or as they're written or as they're witnessed, Hearing the language and hearing the sounds and hearing the, the way in which the language works in context helps, uh, you know, solidify and strengthen the retention of that language. And so I think that's a, it's a really important thing. It's something we're going to continue to do. I think the dual uh, French-English thing is, is a, something we're going to continue to do as well. Uh, we have a, another translation that we are commissioning in the works um, for the future to do. Because I think it's, it's really wonderful to see that to those artists be that virtuosic. Indigenous artists are not just, you know, the, just, it's such a, it's incredibly virtuosic to be able to do a play um, in two different, completely different languages, uh, let alone the indigenous languages as well, and the content of the play. So uh, I don't know, I think it's really cool. Over time, do you plan to have indigenous groups from outside Canada come and perform? 
Absolutely. In fact, we were supposed to have as our closer this year, Hot Brown Honey from Australia, which is uh, all indigenous matriarchs from Australia. And they are, pardon my language, you're kick ass. <laughs> They're amazing. They're so good. Uh, it was a real heartbreaker to have to lose that uh, as our season closer. That would have been an amazing show. And, you know, hopefully we'll be able to bring them back in the future. Okay. Um, how... How have you been keeping busy in the last two months? Like, is it basically one Zoom call after another? Or? Yeah, there's a lot of that. I sit like this in these, you know, and I do Zoom calls from across the country and just at the NAC pretty much every day. Uh, I, I try to not do anything on the weekends. I try to be very, but, you know, this whole like shutdown hasn't really shut us down. We're still, we're still, the NAC is still working. We're still trying to figure out how we're going to get back into the building. What does the, you know, planning for what the future will bring to the institution and how that looks. And, and of course, all of the current events are factoring into all of our decision making more and more and more and more, which requires more consultation, which requires more meetings. Um, trying to find time, you know, it was supposed to people, some, some people in the creative art the industry are like, well, this is a great time to write. And I haven't found this to be a very, very good time to write. It's been impossible to be great. Like I, I, you know, I play instruments and, and even writing songs right now. I just like, uh, <laughs> I find them just so frustrated. It's impossible. Even the the base level at which I write has been a real challenge. Like I, I went through three weeks of some of the worst uh, writer's block I've ever had at the beginning of this. So what, what do I have to say that hasn't already been said around the world, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, I find also this, this having to be, you know, in one space all the time. I find it, I find it harder to work not just writing creative, but just work in general. I find it, I'm not as clear. I'm, I'm, I'm having to really force the thoughts forward <laughs> in order to get them out. Uh, I just, it's, it's been really painful. Um, Oops. Have, have, have there been any insights? Have you um, uh, reevaluated what's important through all of this process? Um, I don't know. I, I think that uh, somebody's calling me from France. I suspect that they're not actually. <laughs> uh, sorry, what was the question again? Um, what are your insights? What have you What have you sort of discovered about yourself, about what you what you what you want to do? Um, insights. Oh God. <laughs> I think that. Uh, I think a lot of. Where we at are, where we're at, I think, culturally right now with this big question about like, you know, with, with the race and the systemic racism being front and center, it is really uh, emboldened, you know, the, the project that, this, that, that we're involved with at the in Indigenous Theater and in the work that I do in my own company um, in British Columbia, Savage Production Society. Um, it is really, it's put that, I think, it's reaffirmed how important the work that we're doing is um, and that more needs to happen and that the systems around which, and it's really highlighted the, how the systems around the way we do work operate and how those systems exclude um, or, and benefit certain things, right? They either exclude or they benefit. And, and to try to figure out a way that it works for us and how can we redefine uh, the way in which we work? I think that's a huge question in our industry right now. It's, it's an enormous question in the industry. In fact, it's, it's, it's taking up a lot of bandwidth right now with, um, with uh, leadership and uh, artists across the country is the way in which we engage in this work and how does that um, affect these, these questions that we have around systemic racism and prejudice and you know all of these things that we're wrestling with and I think that that has really been front and center in my mind. Are you tempted to have more sort of panel discussions and and written manifestos and things like that or uh, on the contrary is it all is it going to be more and more about channeling it through the art as such? I think the that the most powerful way is to channel it through the art. I think that, you know, you can make a statement or you can have a panel discussion and it kind of comes in one ear, not the other. I think that what really matters is how you put it on the stage or in the work that you're doing in the community, uh, how you actually walk, right? Like you can talk the talk, but how do you actually walk the walk? And so, um, but beyond that, I think that, that um, it's not 
it's not just about the product of the work, right? It's not just about, it's how do we get that work onto the stage? What was the processes that were involved to make sure that everybody uh, was taken care of, that everybody was felt safe, that they could give the best work that they can offer to the work, to the, to the, to the art, um, and to be able to presence this work in a really good way. I mean, that's a, you know, we, we have institutions that, you know, sort of dictate the way in which we gather in, you know, in a rehearsal hall and versus how we do it the tech week and, and we have all these kinds of agreements and things like that. And, and they don't always work the way that they're intended. Um, and how can we make that uh, a better system um, that embodies uh, different points of view and different realities? Okay. I think we'll, um... Uh, stop there for now uh, with uh, fingers crossed for a speedy return to uh, some kind of normal life. Um, thanks very much, Kevin Loring, for joining us. Uh, thanks, as always, to our sponsors at the Canadian Bankers Association for making this possible, our friends at the National Arts Centre, who are remain our kind of virtual hosts, even though we're doing it through webcams. Um, Kevin, have a good summer, and I hope uh, we'll, we'll see you and your colleagues back at the NAC real soon. Thanks, Dave. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good night.